Okay, we're going to get started today. Thank you all for coming. And um, before we get started, I just want to take a moment, uh, maybe a moment of silence to um, uh, stand with the people in Buffalo and Texas. Thank you. Um, I'm going to start by reading our land acknowledgement, and then I will introduce our speaker. Every community owes its existence and vitality to generations from around the world who contributed to making the history that led to this moment. We recognize that all of us at UW Tacoma learn, live, and work on or near the unceded territory of the Coast Salish people. In particular, our campus is situated on the traditional lands of the Puyallup tribe. As we gather virtually, we also want to acknowledge the lands of the Muckleshoot, Nisqually, Squicomish, Snohomish, Sammamish, Duwamish, and all traditional lands on which we live and work. We want to acknowledge the histories of dispossession and forced removal and reflect on this history in ways that honor the memory of those dispossessed and keep us committed to the cause of social justice for indigenous populations. Sure. Our speaker today is Dr. Billy Sankofa Waters, who's an assistant professor in education. And she's going to be talking to, to us today um, about <clears throat> toward a radical identity praxis, researching with folks who look like me. Take it away, Billy. Hey, y'all. <laughs> Um, this is an intimate gathering with folks in person and virtual. And so I love intimate gatherings because I get to just, I'm going to be myself anyway. So, hey, <laughs> um, I always open with libations. So thank you, Cheryl, for doing the land acknowledgement. And libations is a traditional ceremony where typically I would have a plant and water and say the names of folks who have, who are with us, who have gone on and acknowledge children yet born. And so for me, it is an honoring of the energy that is in the room, the people that I bring with me, the people that you bring with me, because we are standing on a lot of shoulders. We are standing on a lot of territory. And so I ask you if you are comfortable, as you are comfortable, speak the name of someone or the names of people who have gone before you, whether it is a family member or a beloved ancestor as we call their names out to just pay tribute to setting the tone for the space. All right, so I'll start. Uh, my mother passed away July of last year, so I always lead with Mary Temple Rhodes, Ashe. We can collectively say them. James Baldwin, Ashe. 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 Yes, Ashe, Zora Neil Hurston. Thank you just for creating a more sacred and open space. So that said, this is, um, I wanna say my hour research project. And I start with my family. Um, I am a storyteller and my soul's work is lifting stories of folks to create collages and quilts. Why do I use the quilt metaphor? Because they keep us warm. They were crafted by our great grandmother's hands. They brilliantly build beauty from so-called scraps. They tell stories of generations and they provide maps for liberation. The quilt is the guide. The quilt is hip hop. And these are the goals of black storytelling. The quilt of black folks narratives serves as a multimedia gallery of histories and futures, and I get to be a bridge in the generations. So this picture is, I call it the plantation picture. It's one of the oldest pictures in our family. Um, my mom used to keep our photos in an old popcorn box in the top of a closet where the boogeyman lived in my mind. So I never really wanted to go in there, but one day I convinced her to pull the, the popcorn box down and all of these treasures are in there and I call them pieces of gold. So, oh, you all don't see what I'm looking at. Mm, mm, mm. There we go. <laughs> this is the plantation picture. Um, and I always introduce myself naming um, 
who I am, what generation I'm from, my city and my superpower. So I am a hip hop generation black girl from the South side of Chicago who writes. I am of 1979 and my identities are black mother creative Sankofa Waters and I am a student. And these are the people that I come from. That little person in the middle with the crown is my father who was born in 1931. He is the 11th of 12 children. These are his brothers and sisters. So seated is my great grandfather and grandmother. Above them is my grandmother and grandfather. Um, let me move this out of the way a little bit. And the ones with the hearts on them are the family members that I actually knew growing up. The one to the far left who looks like she's scowling because she's a diva uh, is Aunt Edith. She changed the spelling of her name because of the diva that she is. And she lived to 2016, 17. She's the only one that was able to see my son. Um, and she was born roughly 1913, I think. Um, so this is, these are the pieces of gold that we have and not, and I recognize that not everybody has this. Some people have moved a lot, have had floods and fires in their homes. Some people didn't have the equipment to do this. So I do not take it lightly that I have these pieces. Um, so <clears throat> around the top of the pandemic, May 2020, when we kind of thought it was over or we were going to come out of it, but we had just got it started, my sister and I started having these sessions where we would brainstorm our research project. She's over at the University of Pittsburgh. And this work started coming out of that. It was originally a literacy blueprint for my nonprofit. And then it was supposed to be the background for, I wanted to write a book. I still wanna write a book on a different world, talking about intergenerational mentorship and identities. And then I was like, okay, I wanna anchor everything in black families and how do we come to understand ourselves? And as the pandemic started going on and the murder of George Floyd happened, it's like, I'm tired, I'm sick of this. What would happen if I started pivoting away from the white gaze and just turn my attention to the richness of black folks? What if I just turn my attention to what my grandmother and grandfather talked about? What if I just talked about the candy lady and the neighbors and so on and so forth? Um, because this was, yeah, before my mother passed. And so it's actually right before my mother passed. I got the IRB um, acknowledgement July 1st and was at her apartment and was so excited. And I'm telling her like, I got IRB approval. And she had no idea what that was. And, but my mom was also my first reader through my dissertation project, which focused on black mothers. And at the time I wasn't a black mother. So she was my anchor and my second reader. And I would lay in bed with her and read her passages. And it was beautiful. And she, when I told her like what the interview protocol looked like for this project, she was like, well, you need to interview me. Mom's an 82 feisty woman, you know, with Jack Daniels under her bed. And um, July 31st, she passed away. And so I feel like she gave me a jetpack to do this project. And when she passed away, it made me recall uh, when my father passed 25 years earlier that I wish I had known him more. I wish I had known him better. And it didn't occur to me to look outside of the family, to talk to the neighbors about him or his coworkers or other people that had interacted with him. I only kept it insulated in the family. So this project is like, let's talk about the village not just the people in our homes, because sometimes the people in our homes don't have the stories, we're scared to share, we keep secrets, but there are so many other people that can fill us out. And so for this work, I centered the voices of 13 folks, interviewed by me, the interviews are still in process, and each person was born within the critical influence of hip hop across the Deep South, two folks in Southern California, folks in New York, and the Midwest is thick. We pivot away from Du Bois' musings regarding the white gaze in 1903. What does it feel like to be a problem and pivot toward black folks are rich. This is not about a monetary or currency richness, but it is the richness and the stories that we tell and how we let grandmama breathe by giving her freedom 
to be able to speak and be seen and be heard because oftentimes our stories are not told because we had to, our grandparents had to hold the stories for survival. They had to be quiet so that they would not be killed. And so it is our job to not forget these legacies that we have inherited because the shame is not ours to hold. The shame is never ours to hold, but to again, give space for these folks to breathe and let them know we're okay. Or we're working toward being okay. <laughs> so as I started collecting these narratives and I'll go back, to, well, no, I won't go back to that yet. So black storytelling is not my framework. It is a framework where I borrow so many folks and this serves as a reflection and a theory and a practice of mapping intersectional identities. So I named three types of stories. The first is firsthand stories. It's what I see, it's what I know, it's what I've experienced. I am the live witness. The second one is hand-me-down stories. Those are the firsthand stories of our ancestors, of our aunts and uncles and the folks next to us. They are the stories of James Baldwin and Nikki Giovanni that we pull from. So again, it's not just our household, but it's hand-me-down stories that we get to tell on and on and on. And then there are the kaleidoscope stories. Those are the stories when once you hold them up, everybody has a different angle for how they saw it. And every angle is true. The example I give is Thanksgiving several years ago, my then boyfriend and sister were in a car driving on a very, very dark country road to our girlfriend's house for dinner and North Carolina, and she, I forget what kind of sturdy mobile that she had, but we ran over a dead deer because my sister drives like a crazy woman. And, you know, we were glad that the deer was not harmed. The deer was already in the road. She swears that she did not run over the deer. I swear that she did. So me, my husband and her have three different stories around the fact that my sister cannot drive well, but we were safe. And the stories are all true, apparently. So those are kaleidoscope stories. Every vantage point matters. And there's no one that can say that the one truth that pivots up is more important than the other. And so when we start talking about Black storytelling um, as, a, as a reflection and as a theory, sorry, I am building on indigenous and critical ethnography. I am building on Black feminism. I am building on critical race theory, fugitivity, and art and music. Black feminism is centered because Black feminism in all its denominations, crunk feminism, womanism, critical race feminism, all denominations are true for me. And Black feminism is for everybody. Black women are in the labor for everybody. And so when we talk about indigenous critical ethnography, I'm talking about unearthing the stories that are most intimate to us, that are personal to us, that the end of one can tell how a neighborhood was demolished and reinvented itself. The end of one can tell us about a sharecropping family who did fishing in New Orleans and migrated across the South to California to produce basketball players and CEOs of their own businesses. So when we talk about N of one, it is not about it being scalable or looking at longitudinal data. That individual story is criterion for meaning. That individual story gives breath and life to liberation. And so these are my pillars. Looking at, and when I say Black storytellers, I'm talking about James Baldwin. I'm talking about Soyini Madison. I am talking about Sandy Grande. I am talking about Zora Neale Hurston and Cynthia Dillard and Robin Boylorn. And it is important for me to say their names. I am not just talking about people who are academicians, but I am talking about people who write to save their lives. As a method, this is what I also use to structure my interview protocol. And this was part of the brainstorming sessions that I would have with my sister early before I knew what the name of this was. And there are four movements. Uh, we kept calling them movements or cycles. And my sister was like, yeah, they have to be cycles because we need more than one to be free. So this is constantly turning. And the first one is to record. Record and tell the story of home. 
whatever home means to you. If it's a physical place, it's an imagined place, it's a place that crosses the deep south and over west, who makes up home? Who is that village? Who are the people who are privileged with taking responsibility for you? The second is to reconnect to the Black diaspora. And as you're recording these stories of home and of the village, that's where my analysis gets to come in. And as I'm asking questions, I'm making sense of you growing up in the Bronx in 1970 and me growing up in Chicago in 1981 and Cassandra growing up in South Cali, South, uh, Southern Cali in the early 80s. And the fact that we're all saying, yeah, I grew up on the Cosby show. Yeah, we had macaroni and cheese. Yeah, we had to come in when the streetlights came on. And all of these things tell us that our stories are not insulated, that there are maps and quilts that we can build onto one another, and there are roads that we can see to find each other. So reconnecting the Black diaspora, the power of this is we can critically understand our individual stories within a broad American context. The third movement is rewarding the self. This means acknowledging who you are, your agency, and also acknowledging the land that you sit on, that you toil on, that you're there to curate, not own. And it's about exercising agency by embracing the inner child, the erotic, as Audre Lorde talks to us about, the spirituality and the body. The fourth step is simply to repeat the movements. And in this way, we build cultural wealth with the village. Tell the story over and over again. Even when it hurts, pause, step away. Tell the story over and over again. That's the power of griots and that's the power of understanding the importance of our history. Um, it is the Sankofa, which is part of my last name, which is a Ghanaian term that means to go back and retrieve what is useful. We can't do that if we don't remember as Dr. Cynthia Dillard tells us. So, terms for my research folks. I, again, have created this project with the people who are doing the project. So it is co-created and I'm moving away from using language around subject and bias-free and objectivity. I don't even believe in that. So here are some of the terms that have come, come forth. So the first is cipher. Instead of calling the sessions interviews, I go between conversations and ciphers. Cypher is a circle. It's a verbal exchange where two or more folks are building lyrics, creativity, and knowledge, hip hop ciphers. Two, understanding the diaspora. It is voluntary enforced movements and settlements of African ascendant folks across the globe. I use the word ascendant intentional. I got that from Cynthia Dillard. And instead of saying descendant, saying ascendant. The third, is Mike's represents who or what currently has command of the stage. Four, village. When I use village, I am talking about family, I am talking about community, I'm talking about people of blood and of spirit who are related to you. And that is defined in this context as two or more folks who pour into one another. It's a reciprocal relationship. Five, we're looking at rich. That is the affirmation for the cultural wealth of black folks. Six folks. I use the term folks spelled F-O-L-X intentionally as an acknowledgement of intersectional and non-binary non people. And seven, Black. Black is a contested term. It is a political identity for me. And I use it as an inclusive inclusive ethnic racial identity of African ascendants. So these terms are not absolute. These are how I am using them for this particular context. And I go back and forth with some of the participants. I have one that did not want to list black as an identity, I have one that did not want to talk about community. And so all of these have different textures throughout the, the, the work. But I moved to talk about ciphers and mics and the hip hop generation originally the parameters for the interviewees or the folks was from 75 to 85. And one night I'm trying to sleep. All these people are talking to me. I got people's grandmothers and aunties talking to me constantly. Like really, I am Oda Mae Brown from Ghost. And apparently I signed up for this. <laughs> and so um, 
one of my girlfriends, her voice, she's a beautiful poet. She's a healer. She's amazing. And I just saw her so beautifully talking um, as I was trying to sleep. And I'm like, she has to be a part of this process. She has to be included. And her birth date is 1968. And I'm like, I have this arbitrary frame for how I'm gathering folks. And I said, I got to bust it open. And so I automatically, I started going through research and I was like, you know what? All of us are talking about hip hop. All of us are talking about the impact of what's happening to us in these major cities. I'm like, I have to include 1968. And so in talking to her and how powerful our conversation was, we got into what it means to have a flexible methodology. And so she forced me to everything to call everything ciphers, to look at them as mutual engagements between myself and understand myself as the 13th participant of this project. So now you get to see the people. I love them. Um, these are friends, family, new friends, new family, unknown people that volunteered for this project just off of the strength of another relationship that I had with a mutual person in contact. Um, so the first is Fats from Richland County, South Carolina, born in 77. Fats says that village was my grandmama's house. He talks about that's where he learned about hip hop and his uncles and he first started watching porn and he learned the, how to navigate the neighborhood inside and outside. Journey born in 1979 is from Brooklyn, New York, all the way. This is a picture of her and her sister. And she laughs and jokes because of all of the pictures that were around her house, which was incredibly African centered. And she says, you know, I thought Marcus Garvey was my father, right? Oh, Sofo, who was born in 1984 outside of Atlanta, Georgia in Decatur, talks about we were a baloney household. They had to piece things together to make it. Ruby, 1980, is sitting on the front porch of the house that her grandfather built from the ground up on 150 acres in Mississippi. And she says, the family knows I got it. Cassandra, 1979, from Pasadena, California, who currently lives in Chicago, so much so that I forget that she's from Southern California. <laughs> But this is a picture of her great grandparents. And she says, Black joy hasn't gone anywhere for us to have to reclaim it. Yahira, 1968, who calls me to call these ciphers, is from the Boogie Down Bronx, New York, who played outside to beats produced by Grandmaster Flash before we even knew who he was, says, I am writing myself out of enslavement. And she chose this picture because she said, I want people to see how I've aged gracefully and who I am right now. Diane, Big Mama Diane, 1975 from West Blockton, Alabama. She represents the Deep South all day long. And she says in a haiku, who said all the Southern Bells were white girls? Y'all can kiss my grits. Oshun from 1980, my Chicago sister says that I am not a tragic mulatto. She embraces her light skin as an African warrior and is mother, other mother to 10 kids and young adults. Marshall, another 1968 from Chicago who currently lives in Maui, Hawaii. After having endured um, his family, he lives on the block where Fred Hampton was murdered and enduring several riots and rebellions on the west side of Chicago and becoming a freedom fighter with Chairman Fred's son and an active poet finally decided he couldn't do it anymore. He had too much PTSD. And he says, I didn't grow up under the fist of men. Hector from 1984 from Escondido, California, born and raised in a predominantly white neighborhood to which his father and mother made sure that he still had black doctors and dentists and coaches. He said, I saw my daddy wear a hoodie to work. He built his own business. Layla, 1981 from Gary, Indiana. She represents Gary so hard. I am from Chicago. I don't care about Gary, but she represents Gary so hard. And she says, and she is a mixed um, ethnicity between black and Persian. And she says the blackness brings the flavor. Khan, 1983, 
This is a picture of his father, who is Jamaican, surrounded by young girls in the 80s, um, probably his girlfriends. I couldn't even include all of the girls in the pictures, but it's fly. And he says, I love dark skin. These are the voices and the people and the folks and the friends and the families that I've had the privilege of working with since September of last year. And we represent over 168 ancestors and folks that we can name stretching back to 1795. <clears throat> How am I doing on time? Okay. <laughs> Okay. Okay. I see Linda. Okay. So how I'm organizing this work, because it's a lot. And for somebody who loves coding and analysis, woo, I'm, I'm going a little crazy. But I decided to organize it into five chapters. And I didn't realize that what was happening is I had five mics as what the Source magazine, the premier hip hop magazine when I was growing up would give five mics to the best album of the year, right? And so as I was coming up with the titles of the chapters, I realized that I was shouting out my favorite rapper for every quote. So y'all get to get this realness. So the first chapter introduction is, yo, microphone check one, two, what is this? And that is from Bugging Out by A Tribe Called Quest 1993. Chapter two gives, I know what I know and I know it well not to ever forget is from Kendrick Lamar. The name of the song is called Mama. And so this second chapter sets up how we understand institutions and how they affect and shape our identities. The focus is on schools, churches, and hip hop as our primary identities. And again, that's Mama. And of course, home represents Mama. Mama represents home. The third chapter, I'm supposed to smile as if God knew that I would be troubled is from Andre 3000 on Life of the Party track with Kanye West. This chapter focuses on the stories, all of the stories of the 12 and me, the 13 of us. Four is every ghetto, every city and suburban place I've been is, yes, I see you mouthing it, Lauren Hill, 1999. And this is the summation of all of the stories. Every ghetto, every city, every suburban place I've been, this is a thematic analysis. And the fifth chapter, my only says shine your light on the world is the outro, most deaf Yasin Bey, again, 1999, black on both sides. And so this final chapter is giving libations and credits to folks who have done the work before me, folks who have passed on while this work was being created and folks that were born while I was doing this work. Um, it is important for me to shout out folks constantly it sounds like a long list of acknowledgements and the same goes for our participants or my participants and the folks with me. We spend so much time talking about the folks that raised us that that takes up all of the space. And for two of my participants in particular that were born in 1968, I've had to throw the interview protocol away. When you talk to folks who were really, really born at the onset of hip hop, they don't care about no script. We making it up as we go along. So when I talk to Yahira and I'm trying to ask her, where did you grow up? What starts happening is she's telling me about the parties where the light bulbs would be torn out or Grandmaster Flash is playing or they're using uh, urinated trampoline, urinated mattresses and lots of trampolines or doing all sorts of things like playing and, and collecting bottles and cans for money so they could have their own money because they saw mama struggling and they didn't want to go on a field trip to the museum and not be able to buy something. So they had to have their own pocket change. She's telling me all of this off of one question. So baby, I can't get to question number 10 because she's already answered more than that. She taught me about throwing the interview protocol away and just being present. And that was difficult for me as a good researcher in terms of um, getting my T's and my I's together because I sometimes have allowed the interview protocol to get in the way so I miss the story that's being told. I couldn't do that anymore. I stopped taking notes. I don't necessarily rely on my recorder as heavy. I take a couple of words down and then I do notes as soon as I'm done. I keep three journals 
after I'm doing work with any of these participants, especially those who don't follow the script. And some of them do, because I do have a couple of folks who have research backgrounds. So they talk to me as a researcher, but then I have other folks who talk to me like their girlfriend and I can't keep up with those stories. <laughs> um, and this is also the issue when you're talking to people who you are in relation with prior to. For me, again, being a good researcher is what does it mean in terms of ethics and bias to research with folks who are in your backyard? Well, I'm telling family stories. This is, um, all of a sudden my mind just went blank. <laughs> Again, these stories are valid, whether they're in my backyard or not. And I'm using purposeful sampling with folks who are born in the hip hop generation, because as with me, the picture that you saw, the plantation picture, my parents were born of the silent generation. So they're in the 1930s. My parent, I mean, my brothers were born 20 years before me. They are boomers. I am generation X, borderline, and I consider myself hip hop. And we are currently situated as folks who are taking care of our parents and our elders, as well as raising our children. We are sandwiched in a place that is so important in bridging all of these different identities. So my mom and dad gave me Billy Eckstein and Nat King Cole and Larry Graham, my brothers gave me Prince and Jimi Hendrix and Ario Speedwagon. My big sisters in the neighborhood gave me New Edition and LL Cool J. And so when I talk to folks around me and how, again, when I said, what was one of the most important things you all did during the week? Of course, the Cosby Show. Like literally three of my participants leaned and said the same exact thing right? Because we all have these identities that mirror one another, and we have to make sense of this quilt. What does it mean for the generation that we're honoring before us? And what does it mean for our children that are going out now? And hip hop is inc incredibly important to me because it is a protest movement. It is a movement in intellectualism and creativity and innovation. We decided to name our son Tribe because he is a village but also because it was the same day that Fife Dog died and we wanted to honor Tribe Called Quest. So this is not a game. This is talking about people in this iteration, hip hop and research has been seen, it has been understood through curriculum and how it impacts K through 12 education. It has been understood chronicling historical uh, movements in terms of rebellions and protests, but it hasn't really been understood how hip hop has influenced us to become successful, amazing members of society who are contributing to different businesses, ideas, and productions. So this is an honoring, not just of our grandparents and our children, but it is an honoring of the architects who have been in our commercials, who've been in our headphones, who've been in our shoes, whether we knew all of the lyrics to Run DMC's albums or not, hip hop has influenced every single one of us. And so I am making intentional efforts to honor that in the way that we live every day. So almost done y'all. Hip hop, I just said it. Oh, I was ahead of myself already. So we talked about um, two of the major institutions. So this work is speaking back to institutions to privilege home as the primary place of understanding and knowledge production. Um, hip hop is a knowledge production as well. So um, when I go into institutions, I start off asking my participants or the folks like, name and order the institutions that had the primary influence over you. And these institutions are called from like Patricia Hill Collins understandings of uh, sociological behaviors and power domains. So we're talking about the neighborhood, church, um, extracurricular activities, work, uh, government and military involvement. And so the three most salient things that came up in terms of influential institutions was church, school, home, period right, in varying order. And so for schools, my position is that strong Black identities nurtured in home places always trouble Eurocentric curricula and foster urgency to decolonize educational spaces. 
This picture is actually me in my pre-K class around 1982. And a lot of times in our education work, people ask, when was the first time you had a black teacher? And unfortunately for many of my students, including my doc students, I am their first black teacher, which is heartbreaking to me. But for me, I've always had black teachers. It's hard for me to know when my first white teacher was. And so we're getting into the conversation of does, it, does having a black teacher mean that you have a better education? Not necessarily, but being able to see yourself reflected in the faculty, in the decorations, in the announcements, in the curriculum is something that, again, we can understand that from schools, but I also wanna make sure that we're understanding again, the candy lady the person at the gas station, the people who were our next door neighbors, that those are our schools as well. Um, and the picture to the left is actually a graphic design for my husband's work, who focuses on hip hop stories and street images and reappropriates, reappropriates them with different faces. So you have Malcolm X, uh, Kwame Ture, Dr. King, James Baldwin, um, playing dice in Harlem in the 80s. Um, and his collection is called Somewhere in Another Dimension. So this is how we understand hip hop moving globally and moving intergenerationally. Um, I feel like I'm kind of moving all over the place because I'm getting fast. And so I want to get to the other things and then we'll wrap up. Um, so here are some of the major themes from the work. What does it mean to really name home and to remember home and to remember ourselves? Do we create altars, sacrifice goats, take DNA tests? Um, I've done all of these things. Um, I've had the privilege of having a DNA test and travel to Cameroon. And then my cousins have done a lot of this DNA digging work. So this is not something that I've taken on my own. I've been scrapbooking for as long as I remember, but I have cousins who are retired who have the resources now to document our family back to the mid 1800s or earlier. And one of the pushbacks that my husband has always given me because of the Ma'afa and what has happened to us through enslavement and so on and so forth. Uh, so many of us are thirsty to understand our African roots, which is totally valid and understandable. But my husband is like, well, what about your family in Kentucky? What about your family in Texas? What about those people that are accessible here um, or maybe not as accessible? And having to recognize that for those of us who can do the DNA test and travel to Africa is can be a performance in elitism. And so we have to be careful and honor that and manage that in particular ways. Um, but also don't skip over Texas to go to Africa. <laughs> and so that is another root of this project is to really focus on home. And I often tell folks that do research, you don't have to go and research that community over there. Research your community right here. Get your own folks. So these are the things that come out of me getting my own folks. 1968 is a pivotal year for many folks, not just the birth year of my participants, but it is the year that Dr. King was assassinated. It is a year where we point to the deacons of self-defense um, really giving birth to the Black Panther movement and becoming larger. 68 is a marker for hip hop. 68 is a paradigm shift for many of us, for all of us, I would say. Um, so from across the country, we talk about what our cities taught us in the Deep South, in California, in the Midwest, on the East Coast, being born and raised with siblings who were born in 68, ourselves who were born in 68, and what is the, the aftermath of the riots that happened and the rebellions and what our families, how our families grieve these losses. My parents were actually born, I mean, married three years after King's assassination. And I wonder, did that assassination, how did that affect the love and the energy and the movement of that time, like the need to be able to develop love relationships in the middle of horror. Um, second theme, Cosby kids. I've already talked about that. Uh, three, <laughs> love stories and tall tales, laying out Big Mama's clothes. Big Mama Diane talks about how her grandfather suffered PTSD from war and then lost their grandmother to death and how he grieved and he would just sit by the record player and just mourn her loss and not move and he became embittered and he drank and he was kind of 
sad. But whenever they would come over to the house and ask for a stick of butter, he and he would still make peanut butter sandwiches for them. And he was the one that he wanted his wife to look clean when she went to work on her nursing shifts. So she would come home on her lunch break and he would lay out her clothes for her so she could have a difference because our clothes would be so messy and so messed up that he would make sure she would look clean and had lunch when she came home. He took care of her. He pampered her. And there are oftentimes we don't hear these love stories. So when she left, he suffered a great loss and having and him still having enough love for his grandchildren and trying to express that love through his pain is a story that's worth telling. Um, stay away from cousin John. Full stop the stories that are not ours to hold. Uh, Robin Boylorn talks about my secrets or somebody else's secrets. So this is giving air to shame and allowing some of us to breathe through the things that we aren't supposed to talk about, but we have to talk about. Accidental educators didn't realize that more than half of my participants hold terminal degrees. Um, that could be seen as like, you just chose people who did it. No, it just happens that um, the people that I chose who do have terminal degrees first identify as basketball players, poets, artists, they don't have their identity wrapped up in research or higher education, but they recognize they had peers and mentors that poured into them that said, you know what, I want you to extend your influence and get another seat at a different table. And so they became like, I fell into a PhD program. Yes, that has a lot of privilege. So we talk about that, but we talk about what it means to leave home, but to not, be, to not leave the space where you're still learning and teaching and learning over and over again. And that brings us to grandmama's house. That is a site of resistance. That is a site of love. That is a site of school and learning and knowing and healing. Full stop. Um, this is, I'm not going to read all of this, but in the early part of the interviews or the ciphers, I asked folks, what is black to you? This is a poetic transcription of their responses across the 13 participants. And so it's bits and words and pieces, robust, rich, gold chains, grills and rims, wicker park pawn shops with old hip hop records still in plastic, pawpaw riding through Gulfport with a shotgun to let you know he ain't scared. Grandma make the laws, cookouts, block parties, and reunions with Frankie Beverly, Earth, Wind, and Fire, Shaka Khan, Shuffle Slide on repeat. Uncle Fresh with the gold medallion and Cadillac driving up from North to give us the EPMD tapes. All in your business. You ain't got no business. Porches full, kitchens full with the black bottoms of cousin babies, pots and pans that hold the secrets of dressing, no stuffing. The poem is a lot longer but I'll leave you guys with this. So I am a poet. I am blessed that I had a research and dissertation advisor that told me to never forget that I was an artist. And so when I constructed my dissertation, he told me to lean into the fact that Audre Lorde has done this before, that Zora Neale Hurston is here, that Dr. Cynthia Dillard talks about spirituality and giving of herself and remembering in a way that I am not creating a new will, I am falling in alignment with the other mothers before me and fathers, James Baldwin. So this is one of my gifts to my participants is the poetic transcript. And finally, as an outcome of this project, I claim black storytelling as the vehicle for radical identity praxis, RIP. When I first saw RIP, I was like, that is corny. Ain't nobody trying to talk about rest in peace. Like, that is not what I'm going for. But after the third interview with one of my participants, Ruby, I, I felt the presence of her grandmother very strongly while we were talking. And it just compelled me to tell her, they are so proud of you. They are so proud of you. They are so proud of you. And grandmothers and aunts have come to me consistently. And so the idea of rest in peace became different in terms of the fact that I am sitting with folks, family members, and asking them that you can rest. We're taking the baton. You can rest. We're doing the work that you labored for. You can rest. We're airing out the room for you. And so RIP is the journey of unapologetically cultivating who we are at the roots through Black storytelling, which is a reflection and a practice. We 
the Black storytellers, demonstrate Black folks are rich as an affirmation of cultural wealth. This collective work disrupts institutional anti-Black racism, specifically naming schools, to prioritize home, which is necessary to cultivate Black folks' wholeness and autonomy. Um, and I think we are done. Um, yes, a few shout outs. Um, God, thank you for using, elevating, and holding, and trusting me with this work. Um, the Black Storytellers, 168 plus of our folks, the temples, the roads, Malari Sankofa Waters, Tribe Sankofa Waters, who is my master teacher, Shanice, my sister, prayer warrior, and the first editor, and my mama Mary, the best ghostwriter I've ever had. Ashe. <laughs> so I don't know how much time we have left, but yeah. So any questions? Um, uh, why don't you take some questions on me first? Okay. Okay. Yep, I'm trying to figure out where I'm going. Oh, I wanted to see the chat. Oh, I can't see the chat. We can just talk. Okay, just. Mm -mm. We could just talk. Yeah, we could just talk. Just have people on mic. Hey, y'all. Yes. Hi. <laughs> hey, Linda. Thank you. I'm sorry I was late. Oh, but you, oh, you don't do that. This is recorded, right? Yes. Yeah. Oh, so, so I can get the first half. Yeah. <laughs> this is terrific. Thank you. You know, I had all these images going going through my head is there is it is there someone something that really really stands out for you in terms of the participants yeah different days different standouts different st <laughs> okay um I just spent time with the hero this morning um I said she was running around Harlem like literally running around Harlem FaceTiming me because she had to go get medication for her mother. Her mother lives with her and her daughter. So she's definitely in this intergenerational sandwich place. But she's like, sissy, I want to honor our time. I'm not going I'm not going to reschedule on you this time. And so that's the energy of most of the folks that I talk with. Mm -hmm. It's like, no, 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 no. I'm here for you. I'm here for you. I know I'm changing my clothes in my car, but I really want to talk to you about this thing. And um, and a lot of folks, they'll talk and they'll be like, oh, my God, this is this is so good. I need to go talk to my therapist about this. So I didn't even realize more than half of the folks in the study you know are actively in therapy so you know I I'm in love with all of my participants so um Sonia I see you thank you Dr. Sankofa for sharing with us today um it was really lovely to listen to you and and really um get a sense of the depthness of your work and um, I very much appreciate the fact that you sort of address your own positionality and talk about, you know, how you are a storyteller. So my question's a little bit moving into that direction. Mm -hmm. And um, I wonder, um, in, in doing all of your interviews, what was something perhaps that surprised you from doing this, these interviews? And well, it's a two part question. <laughs> and um, what would you say, and you know, is is something that you might have learned about yourself through this process? Because I can obviously see that this is very personal, obviously. Um, yeah, I'm hesitant to answer, but <laughs> the the first thing that caught me off guard, um, and I've talked about this before, is um, like I said, the majority of my participants have terminal degrees and are, you know, are in education. And so even the ones who don't have terminal deg degrees are still in education. So in the warm up activities, you know, just trying to get people loose, it's like, okay, what was your favorite cartoon? Or what is your favorite da 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 da, -da? Um, And one of the questions is, what was your favorite book? And um, that it happened with two folks. Um, and one of them just kind of shut down. And she was like, I didn't have access to books. Um, I didn't even know about the library in the neighborhood. She was, and so 
that she was one of the first people that said, you know, I had to talk to my therapist when you asked me that question because I didn't realize, and I didn't realize that it was a classed question and that it would be a trigger point. Like there are a lot of questions and work in this and in the interview protocol. Um, and I have counselors kind of on standby for things that I know can be trigger points, but I had no idea that asking for your favorite book growing up would be a trigger point for multiple participants. Um, and so that was huge. And she went on to talk about how her grandmother watched National Geographic on TV. And that's how she was able to travel to different countries and knew so much. But she herself never had the ability to move anywhere outside of that living room. And so that was one of the ways we talked about how education moves and how it's not just in a classroom and what it means to have access. Because I had other participants who talked about the fact that they were the first family in the neighborhood to have full sets of encyclopedias. So the kids in the neighborhood came to their house to read encyclopedias. So that was um, jarring for me because I didn't mean to you know, do that to my participants, but it was also very telling around the depth of this work and my class politics um, that I'm still working through and being careful in how I open conversations um, around this stuff. Um, what am I learning about myself? That's part of it. And one of the things that uh, another person that was interviewing me about this work said was, what's one word that you would use to encapsulate this work, which is crazy hard. But what came to me was healing, healing. And a lot of the folks who do are doing this work with me are saying like, I didn't know that I needed this healing. And so it's healing for me, you know, I, my mom passed away 10 months ago and I just buried her a few weeks ago. And so this is, the fact that this is happening now is not lost on me. It's, it is a, I'm grow, growing into my eldership with this work and it is a lot. <laughs> Thank you so much for sharing and for opening yourself up and being vulnerable and sharing this with us. I really appreciate your work. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Kathy, Kathy's uh, going, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Billy, it is just such a pleasure to um, be able to see this and, and listen to this. And now that I've seen you teach as well, I just think we're just so fortunate in the School of Education uh, to have you <laughs> here with us. Um, but I just am amazed by, it just seems like you're not only bringing this insight to others, but it's like you're just, your explanation of it is that it's, there's this, this true research in that it's constantly informing your work along, along this journey. And that's really beautiful to hear that and that you're so open to, to learning from the process, which yeah. I think, I think people can get very, uh, uh, blinders on and and not see that whole process. So it's really cool just to hear you explain it and be so clear about your methodologies and and how they evolve over time. So thank you so much. It's beautiful. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, when you interview and like when I interview uh, Marshall, he and we happen to be in Maui doing the interview. So he's at home with no shirt on, no shoes, straw hat, walking around, performing. And he's a performance poet. I had two microphones on him and a video camera and still couldn't capture everything. So what, what kind of methodology do you use for that? Like, it's just, you just run with it. Like there's no, he's like, I don't give a damn about your methodology. Like I'm talking to you. So. Uh, imagine my joy in transcribing that. Um, <laughs> anybody in the room? Oh, yeah, yeah. I'd, no, I, 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 that, I misspoke if I said that. I do still record all of the interviews. I don't let them get in the way. Um, and when I say that, so in my dissertation project, I was over-prepared with one of my participants 
and I had two recorders going and all of this. And she was amazing. The interview was supposed to only last like an hour. It was like two hours because I was in her home and I got home and I'm getting ready to take my notes. Nothing had recorded. I was devastated. And I immediately called one of my research mentors and she was like, and I'm crying. And she's like, were you there? I'm like, yes, I was there. She's like, were you present? I'm like, here she go. Yes. <laughs> you know, she said, it happens. She said, get off the phone with me. Write everything that you can remember. You can go back. She said, but let this be a note to you to never let the recorder be more present than you are. Be present. And so that's what I mean. Like, it's always the initial part of the first interviews where I kind of have the the recorders taking up too much space. And then I have to realize, especially if I have a relationship with the person, I have to move it out of the way because they're literally talking to the recorder instead of talking to me. Um, and it stiffens the interviews. Like they're kind of whack the first 15 minutes. So, so when I say like, I have to move it, like kind of like physically out of the way. But they are aware that the recorder is there for sure. Lily? Yeah. Hey, I just hey, wanted to, uh, I have to, I have to go with Linda and be like, man, I, I missed the first piece of first part of it. So I'm glad it's recorded and I can go back and, and take a look. <laughs> um, but I also, I just really appreciated it. It was a lot of, it was really good for me to hear this right now too, because as I think about uh, a research project I'm really excited about, and I have a lot of questions about how I'm going to do it, how I'm going to engage. And I feel like what you shared about your own methodology was really enlightening and what you shared about, you know, with the questions with just some of the, um, I don't want to say pitfalls you hadn't anticipated, but just some of those, yeah, some of those places that you really hadn't realized what kind of an impact that would have. That was, yeah. was really good for me to hear. I feel like this was timed well <laughs> for my benefit. So <laughs> mahalo for that. Um, but I, I, I love this. This is so fascinating to me and I'm really excited to see the first half. Cause I feel like I sort of jumped into a conversation already in process and, and did a little catching up, but, um, yeah, thanks for sharing this. We're always jumping into a conversation already in progress. Good point. <laughs> thank y'all. Well, thank you, Billy. I don't know if you can hear me on the screen. Can you hear me? This is Cheryl. Uh, I, I actually have a question. Okay. How, how did you choose the participants? How did you gather these people? I sent out stuff on social media, okay. um, Facebook, Instagram, and was just like, hey, y'all, I'm doing this work. Because again, I've been scrapbooking for so long and documenting my own family history. So a lot of my friends and folks knew that. Okay. And so it was presented like, hey, if you're interested in kind of looking into your own history and documenting some stuff as a storyteller, come talk to me. Oh, that's great. Great. Yep. Well, thank you. Um, I think we're going to wrap up because I know some people have had to leave already yeah. uh, to go teach. And thank you all for coming. And thank you, uh, thank you, Billy. That was absolutely wonderful. Yay. So thank you very much. <laughs> and uh, hopefully we'll see you again. If I don't see everyone, um, have a good summer. This is our last presentation for, uh, for the year. Um, but uh, thank you all for coming and uh, enjoy. It's not raining. Enjoy what little sun we have. So have a great day. Y'all take Bye, care. Everyone. Thank you. Thank you, Billy.